Greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank and praise God for his goodness in gathering us once again this morning uh, to study from the Word of God. And we welcome uh, each one of you and appreciate it for joining us. Especially welcome Brother Benaya John from Kochi in our midst. And he has been taking the study from the book of Ecclesiastes. And in the last class, we were looking in chapter three, uh, we saw the four arguments that uh, Solomon presented, the monotony of life, a vanity of wisdom, a futility of wealth, and the certainty of death. And then he reconsiders the first argument that uh, life may not be monotonous. And we saw four factors to be considered uh, that removes the monotony of life. Uh, first one, to look up God who orders the time. And then second, to look within. Uh, God has placed eternity in our hearts. Third, to look ahead, uh, the certainty of death. And fourth, to look around uh, the problems of life. So brother will be continuing this study. Uh, let us see God's grace uh, on today's class and commence with prayer. Uh, and after this session, uh, Brother Joy Vergis will be closing in prayer. Shall we look to the Lord? Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, uh, we thank and praise Thee for this morning time, uh, the privilege You have granted us, Lord, to be in Thy presence, and Lord, to be at Thy feet, to hear and uh, study from the Word of God. Father, we Humbly bow down before you, we worship you, we glorify you. Thou art the sovereign, the potentate of time. And as we learn from thy word, he has uh, made everything beautiful in his time. To everything there is a season, to and a time for every purpose under heaven. O oh Lord, and we are exhorted that we need to cooperate with God's timing and give God the rightful place in our lives so that life is not going to be meaningless or uh, monotonous. We thank and praise the Lord for the gift of life and uh, the eternity that you have uh, placed in our hearts and that we have been created for the uh, eternal realm and that when we pass away from this world, our spirits will return to God. And so, Father, uh, we pray that the light of eternity, uh, thou would help us to uh, live this uh, short period of time on this earth, uh, looking unto thee, to set our minds on things above, where the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so, Father, we pray that thou would uh, open our hearts to uh, understand these wonderful uh, truths from thy word and uh, through this our lives would be transformed and uh, we would live uh, lives which are pleasing to thee uh, totally uh, in submission to thy will O lord this morning we commit thy servant uh, brother benaya john into your loving hands pray lord for the needed grace and unction from above as he uh, expounds from the scriptures and lord also we pray for Every brother and sister who have joined, uh, we seek thy blessing and we pray that thou would, uh, uh, that we would be edified and it would be all for thy own glory. Uh, we pray for smooth net connectivity and we pray that thou would help us to hear uh, from thy word. Uh, we give thee all the glory and honor and praise. Now this humble prayer in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Benaya. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yes, yes, brother. Just let me share my screen. Greetings uh, to you all once again in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank God for one more opportunity that the Lord has given that we could 
be together like this in the presence of God and uh, meditate together from his holy word. Uh, we have been studying for the last few classes uh, from the bo uh, book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, we saw that Ecclesiastes was a book of man's reasoning, uh, the book where man tries to find the purpose of his existence. And we saw that the person who is uh, in this quest is none other than the wisest man who lived on this world, uh, in, in this world, uh, King Solomon himself. If anyone had the resources and the opportunity to make such a quest in his life, uh, it would be Solomon. He had the resources, he had the power, and he had the heart to seek that, and he had the wisdom to apply uh, and and to to investigate all the uh, matters that are there in all the corners of life and to set that in order and to uh, you know analyze each of them and come up with conclusions and we saw the conclusion that he made right at the beginning uh, of of the book in chapter 1 and verse 3 it says vanity of vanities says the preacher vanity of vanities all is vanity what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun. And we saw in that itself, there are four or five keywords uh, that we see scattered throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and that was vanity and uh, profit and labor and under the sun. And then we saw the word God that is used in a general sense and not in the sense of Jehovah as it is used uh, in the other parts of the Old Testament. We saw that what Solomon is trying to do is to make calculations and to see if there is any net gain, if there is any profit uh, of all that happens under the sun. And uh, when he puts two and two together, when he takes the balance sheet of, his, uh, of, of all that he has calculated, he sees that there is no net profit again under the sun. We saw that Solomon is trying to make four arguments uh, and he's dealing with four special topics and uh, our brother already uh, revised that you know uh, recapped that from the last sessions <coughs> nevertheless he is looking at the monotony of life the vanity of human wisdom the futility of pleasure and the certainty of death and these four topics are over and over again seen uh, you know dispersed throughout the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, and again and again, he is going to revisit each of these so that he can come to a final conclusion. The first argument that he saw raised in uh, chapter 1 and verse 4 to 11 uh, was the argument of uh, that life is meaningless, that life is monotonous, cyclical in nature. What has happened keeps on happening and repeating over and over again. So what is the ultimate meaning if everything is so cyclical in nature? And then he is re-examining that from chapter three onwards. And we saw again, as uh, our brother uh, recollected for us, he said that he discovered, Solomon discovered four factors that uh, must be considered before you can say that life is meaningless and monotonous. Four factors that must be considered before you can say that life is meaningless or monotonous. And he said first, look up. When he looked up, he saw something above man. He saw God who was a potentate of time, a God who was in control of time and who balanced the experiences of life. And how did he balance the experiences of life? All the, uh, all the things that happen in this world under the sun. How is it that this God balances it? We saw that uh, he has placed something within man. He had placed something within man. And within man is something that links man to eternity. Man is not just made for time. Man is made to, to exist beyond time. And he has placed eternity in the heart of man so that that eternity is the one that balances the experiences of life, that balances everything that happens in this life. And uh, that is one thing that we as believers, that man itself, uh, generally forgets to know that there is eternity in his heart. Man is not just made for this uh, uh, 70 to 80 years. 
the 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 shortness of life and the length of eternity is is a calculation that all of us must make is something that all of us must weigh in the balance and see what is greater the shortness of time or the length of eternity and man has been placed uh, in a man has been uh, endowed by the creator of something within us that links us to another dimension that links us to eternity and then uh, as uh, has been mentioned before uh, in in chapter 2 also the end of chapter 3 again uh, solomon saw something ahead of man and that was the certainty of death and he saw that uh, man uh, again and again whatever he does uh, there is no difference uh, between man and animals in one one particular factor in one particular thing that is as everyone as as the animals die as they all have one breath so similarly man also dies but then there is a difference between animals and man all go into one place their bodies all go down into the earth but the the spirit of man goes upward toward him who created him and so therefore solomon says look ahead and make make the best of the life make the best of uh, what uh, has been given to him as his portion <clears throat> that's how he ends chapter 3 Then in chapter four we see another balancing factor that God has put into this world uh, to to prevent life from being monotonous and meaningless. And when you look around, you see the problems and the burdens and the sufferings and the oppressions of life, the inequalities of life, and all this is given <coughs> to prevent life from getting meaningless and monotonous. Uh, I am a person who does not like oats. now many people will not like it when they say that you don't like oats because i think many people uh, love oats and uh, especially the older folks they they eat oats uh, but uh, i for one person am not one who uh, liked oats very much and uh, because i thought it was a very bland <laughs> sort of thing and so uh, you know uh, they brought up a new version right they they brought up something called masala oats Uh, which is basically the same old oats but with some spice added to it so uh, what solomon is saying is all this this things that happen in this world you know it's it's the spice that has been added to take away that monotony and the blandness of life just imagine uh, that you just kept on living that you just kept on existing with no purpose with no meaning with no ups and downs what would be that like you know uh, and uh, uh, all of these oppressions and inequalities under the sun uh, they they all in some way contribute uh, to the meaning to make life meaningful to to uh, to uh, excite our uh, our morality to to excite our uh, inner uh, conscience uh, and and to uh, to to excite the choices that we make uh, everything uh, contributes to adding meaning into this into the life that uh, the lord has given us and therefore uh, he goes into chapter 4 and in chapter 4 basically what he is trying to say is when he looks around everywhere he sees that life is unfair life is unfair and in this unfair life what are the decisions that we make uh, that is what we have to answer for ourselves Uh, even if this life is meaningless and monotonous there are a lot of a uh, lot of things around us that uh, that are problems and burdens and all of that make life meaningless so he is now going to examine the question again and go to where people actually live remember he is the king and he is going to go to where people actually live and try and discover that life is not as simple as just one sentence saying it is meaningless under the sun he observed real people and real situation and the king had to deal with some painful facts like life and death time time and eternity and judgment and all these observations solomon has recorded from visiting the various places in his life and uh, particularly we can see that this is in uh, there is there are a lot of ways to outline uh, you know this uh, chapter 4 but nevertheless just for the sake of our learning we can outline it in this way uh, we he first goes into the court room 
that we see uh, that is what we see in chapter uh, verse 1 to 3 of chapter 4 then he goes into the workplace uh, and this is more of a application oriented thing then he goes into the highway and then he goes into the palace uh, we can outline it in different ways uh, but nevertheless for the sake of our learning uh, let us uh, discover these uh, four places and the discoveries that uh, Solomon makes when he goes into these four places. Uh, and mind you, that all of this can be read as one, uh, one uh, single paragraph, which would, uh, you know, there is a continuity in each of that, and I will mention it as we go forward. So let us, in the will of the Lord, read chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes. <coughs> I'm reading from the King James Version, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on their side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which has not yet been, who has not yet seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Now notice there are four betters uh, mentioned in this chapter. So the first one is uh, in verse 3 that we just read, better is he than both they, which has not yet been, who has not yet seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Verse 4, again I considered all the travail and every right work for uh, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I return and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yeah. He hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yeah, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fail, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another. To help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no, no, no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before him. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Maybe just look to the Lord for his grace in the ministry of the word. Our gracious God, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the gift of the Holy Spirit that expounds thy word to us. We thank thee, Lord Jesus, that all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And thank thee, Lord Jesus, that it is intended that the man of God would be perfect and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, Lord Jesus, we pray that thou would instruct us from thy word this morning, that we would be equipped for every good work, and that we would be made perfect, Lord Jesus, through the reading, through the expounding, through the hearing of thy word. We pray that our lives would be transformed, that we would live for thy glory. Father, grant much grace, for Lord, without thee, we can do nothing. Prepare my, thy servant. Prepare, O Lord Jesus, the hearts of those who are listening. And Lord Jesus, thou would give the words, the right words at the right time. Everything, Lord, would be for thy glory. 
Glorify thy Son, O Father, for we ask it of thee in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So first of all, when Solomon goes into the courtroom, what did he see? Politics is often referred as the conduct of public affairs for private advantage. That is what happens in, in politics. Uh, the nation of Israel had a very good judicial system. You see in Exodus, you see in Deuteronomy, uh, and it was all based on divine law. But that system, it's that system also, you know, it could be corrupted just like uh, anything else. And that you read in five, uh, 5 verse 8, uh, if you just go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at that matter. So corruption in, uh, in an, an oppression and perverting of justice and judgment that was there even in Israel, which had the divine law, which had a very good judicial system that was given by Jehovah himself. And Solomon goes into the courtroom to watch a trial and he saw innocent people being oppressed by power hungry officials. The victims wept, but their tears did no good. Nobody stood with them to comfort them or to assist them. The oppressors had all the powers and their victims uh, they were helpless to protest or to ask for any sort of redressal. And three tragedies the king saw. He saw oppression and exploitation in the halls of justice. Uh, he saw uh, the pain and the sorrow in the lives of innocent people. And thirdly, they saw that there was unconcern, no concern on the part of those who could have brought comfort, who could have brought comfort. And twice, he refers to the term in chapter in verse one that they found no comforter, no comforter. They had no comforter. They had no comfort. And this keen trial also, you know, has been the part of the Lord's suffering people. Uh, this was the same part, uh, uh, the the way of our Master, right? The way that the Son of God consecrated. For us, he said in Psalm 69, reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. I looked for a comforter, but I found none. Sympathy with sorrow, that is indeed very precious. Remember them in bonds as being bound with them. That is what Hebrews said. So when Solomon looked around in this world, Solomon saw that there were a lot of people who were oppressed and there was none to comfort them. And how appropriate is the, the, the instruction by the author of Hebrews that we as believers must remember them under oppression as being bound with them, especially with the Lord's people. <laughs> and our Lord, if you would look, uh, is still touched with the feeling of our suffering. And how little do we realize the sorrow of others, either because they are at a distance from us or we ourselves have no acquaintance with such oppression and sorrow in our own life. And many times we live in our luxury, we live on our comforts and we, we uh, you know, give uh, plenty, uh, plentifully for the work of the Lord. But we always stay at a distance and we have no acquaintance with such oppression and sorrow in our life. So when Solomon goes and considers all the oppressions that are done under the sun, oh, he finds that they have no comforter. They have no comforter and they are so full of sorrow, those who are oppressed. But the oppressors, they had power, but the oppressed, they were still being oppressed. And then uh, Solomon goes from the courtroom to the place of work. He goes into the workplace disgusted with all that is happening in the halls of justice. And in the marketplace, in the workplace, he saw laborers who are at work. And surely he would not be disappointed there because honest toil is a gift from God. Even Adam had to do work in the garden. We read in Genesis chapter 2, Adam also had to work. But Solomon saw that there were four different kinds of people when he saw uh, the people who were working, the people who were laboring. There were four different kinds of people. First of all, he saw the industrious man. We see that in verse 4. 
I considered all travail and every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Now here we saw a man who was working hard. After all, uh, in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, the king had extolled the virtues of hard work. Uh, he had said that, uh, you know, uh, he, he saw that the man was not just busy, he was skillful in his work. He was competent in all that he did. He did all the right work. He had mastered the techniques of his trades so much for the worker's hands. But what about his heart? And it was there that Solomon found his next disappointment. The only reason Solomon is observing that people perfected their skills and worked so hard at their job was to compete with others and to make more money than their neighbors. The purpose was not just to produce something beautiful or something useful to help people, to, to help people, but to, but to stay ahead of the competition, to survive the battle for bread, uh, so to speak. God did not put the selfishness factor into the human labor. That was the result of sin in the human heart. We covet what others don't have. We not only want to have those things, but we want to go beyond and have even more than what others have. Covetousness, competition, envy, all these three words actually very often go together. That was the, the reason for all this hard work that Solomon so competition is not sinful of itself, but when being first is more important than being honest, then there will be trouble. So from the courtroom, as he saw, and then as he walked into the workplace, we can see that that natural progression that at the heart of it all is covetousness, is an envy, is an envy that man has for another, for his neighbor. And that is why he works so hard. Uh, Lord Bacon, a very uh, famous English uh, philosopher, he says like this, a man that has no virtue in himself ever envieth virtue in others. For men's minds will either feed upon their own good or will feed upon another's evil. And the perfect example of this nature of man, the perfect example of totally unprovoked and murderous cruelty was that Irritated by the popularity of the Lord Jesus, in Mark chapter 15 and verse 10, Mark says like this, they knew, uh, Pilate knew they had, that they had delivered him up for envy. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, irritated by how famous the Lord Jesus was getting. Out of envy, they delivered him to Pilate for death. And all the other things were just superficial reasons. To, to give to the Roman Empire, uh, to, to the Roman Empire, to the Ro Roman magistrates, so that they could put him to death. The real, real, true reason was they had delivered him up for envy, out of envy. Uh, that their thought was another and more honorable than us to have the praise, and that is so that is so intolerable to us. Uh, uh, that that thought, uh, we we throw something into the balance to deprecate the fair name, and to preserve the glory of our dearest idol. What is our dearest idol? It is self. Self. And how different is this to the actions of heaven? Uh, every star increases the light of the other star and the multitude of the guests at the supper of the Lamb. You know, uh, what makes the marriage supper of the Lamb more beautiful is that there are so many people there. There will be so many people there. The more People there, the more festive it would be. That is what Bishop Taylor said. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the working of heaven where one more sinner repents. There is rejoicing. There is no envy there. There is like everybody come in, come in. There is always a place at a table. And that is what makes heaven so different. But here, it is just how to push away people and me being first me being first. So even though Solomon saw in the workplace people who were working very hard, he saw that behind it all, the motive, the motive was to be first to because of the envy of his 
labor, of his neighbor. Uh, in the book, The Life and Correspondence of Thomas Arnold, <clears throat> Dr. Arnold says like this, laboring to do God's will, yet not anxious that it should be done by me, rather by others, if God disproves of my doing it. And how, how true that is. We need to labor to do God's will, and yet not worry that it should be done by me, rather by others, if God uh, disapproves of my, of my doing it. Bishop Taylor, in his book, again says like this, Be content that thy brother should be employed, and thou laid by as unprofitable. His sentence be approved, and thine be rejected. He be preferred, and thou in low employment. And, and uh, one, one servant of the Lord prays like this, Dispossess me, Lord, of this bad spirit, and turn my envy into holy emulation. Let me labor to exceed those in pains, uh, to who excel me in parts. Let me feed, foster, nourish, and cherish the graces in others, honoring their person, praising their parts, glorifying thy name who has given gifts to them. Oh, even if I don't get all those gifts, even if I cannot be a preacher, even if I cannot do all those great things, I should be happy. That should not be the, the, the motive of my life to excel somebody else. The, the Paul, Apostle Paul reminds uh, the, the readers in Rome, when, in the book of Romans, he say, in the book of Romans, uh, he says like this, <coughs> each esteeming the other better than himself. Esteeming the other better than himself. Or to get rid of that great vice that is there in our heart of being envious and covetous about one another. May not, may not that be the driving factor of our life. And, and only, only the power of the gospel can make that change, can root out that, that root of envy that is there in us. If there is true communion uh, with, with the body of the Lord Jesus and, and the prosperity of one member would be the joy of the whole. Hmm? And the finger that wears the ring, the other fingers don't envy it, but the other fingers rejoice together because it is an ornament of the whole hand, yea, of the whole body. Hmm? So my dear uh, beloved uh, brethren, uh, let us ask this question. This envy, this, this, this vice, is that not often detected in our own life? Why do we do the things that we do? We labor, we, we minister, we are involved in so many things. But what is the ultimate motive behind all of that? So Solomon went and looked at the person in the workplace. He is working very hard. He is very industrious. But he saw that the motive behind all of that was to become better than his neighbor. And that saddened Solomon. And he said, that also is vanity and vexation of spirit. What profit is there in doing all of that? And from oppression, from a person who is working too hard, Solomon is now going to the other extreme, the person who had no ambition at all. And in verse 5 and 6, <coughs> He says another person who is sort of totally lazy, no ambition at all. Hmm? Just like the, the scientists uh, often uh, do this antithesis study. Uh, they study cold to understand heat better, that sort of thing. So Solomon finds it very difficult to watch the idle man because Solomon had no sympathy uh, for, for lazy people who sat all day folding their hands and doing nothing. And we see that extensively in the book of Proverbs. And Solomon himself was a very industrious man, very hard worker. He, he used to labor. He used to build a lot of things. He was always involved in doing something and, and in making some uh, new buildings or gardens or a lot of things he was involved in. And Solomon did not like laziness. Solomon learned nothing that he did not already know. Laziness is a slow, comfortable path towards self-destruction. It may be pleasant to sleep late every morning and not to go to work, 
but it is unpleasant not to have money to buy the basic necessities of life. And in Proverbs, huh, uh, in, in, in the TLB translation, it says like this, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, this is how it says, let me sleep a little longer, sure, a little bit more. And as you sleep, poverty creeps upon you like a robber and destroys you and attacks you in, in full armor. And Paul stated it very bluntly to, in, to the Thessalonians, if anyone would not work, neither should he eat. Neither should he eat. So we saw the industrious man. We saw the idle man. And then he sees a balanced man, sort of uh, somebody between the two. And the industrious man was motivated by competition and caught in the rat race of life. He had no leisure time. The idle man was motivated by pleasure and was headed for ruin. He had no productive time. And there was a man who was in the middle way uh, between both these extremes. He has productive in his work, but he is also having time for quietness, time for quietness. He did not run in the rat race, but neither did he try to run away from the normal responsibilities of life. And uh, why have both the hands full of profit if that profit costs you, you know, costs you all your peace of mind and possibly even your health? Hmm? Better to have gain in one hand and quietness in another hand. When, when, when your heart is controlled by envy and rivalry, life becomes one battle after the other. And Paul's instruction to Timothy was, you know, godliness with contentment is great gain. And, and, the, and the hardworking man thinks that money will bring him peace, but he has no time to enjoy. Uh, the idle man thinks that nothing will bring him peace, but his own lifestyle destroys him. And the person who is balanced in both, he enjoys the labor and the fruit of his labor when he, when he balances. That is better. That is better. That is what Solomon says. That is better rather than being uh, too hardworking out of envy and then doing nothing saying that it's all a big labor and it is bringing destruction to yourself. It is better to be balanced, to enjoy the fruit of your labor and balance toil with rest. You can take what you want from life, but you must pay for it. And then Solomon sees another interesting character, the selfish man, the selfish man. And you read that from verse 7 to verse almost to the end, uh, it can be read as one single paragraph as well. The selfish man, when he sees, uh, verse 7 to verse 8, Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and not a second. Yeah, he has neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his neighbor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. <coughs> neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul for good? This also is vanity. Yeah, it is a sore travail. Now, the selfish man is, in Solomon's mind, is in constant exercise. Now, he's looking from one person to other. He's turning from one man to another man to get some new illustration of the vanity that is there in this world. The slothful, lazy man, he's sitting with folded hands and contrasting him, we have the covetous fool. Uh, uh, not just a slothful fool, but here we have a covetous fool. Solomon noticed a solitary man, very hard at work. So he went to question him. And very often I find myself in this sort of fool category. Very hard at work, going to question him. And the king discovered that this man had, uh, you know, uh, no relatives, no partners to help him with his business, nor did he desire for any help. Uh, all that he wanted was the profit for himself. He was so busy, he had no time even to enjoy his profits. And if he died, he had no family to inherit his wealth. He had chosen Mammon for his God, and he was a slave of Mammon. His eye was not satisfied with riches. Now, Psalm 39 verse 6, uh, the psalmist reminds us, He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. He was independent of everybody else. Independent of everybody else. <laughs> He never stopped to ask himself, for whom am I working so hard? Why am I robbing myself of all the enjoyments of life just to amass more and more and more money? He earns for himself. He believes himself. It is all for self. We often end up like this when we forget 
the true use and the responsible use of money. Uh, once we, uh, you know, once we as Christians acknowledge the bond, the, 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 the bond that we have, that we are not our own, we are not our own. That's what the Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You are not our own. To that we should add, we are not our own. Neither is our money our own. Neither is our silver our gold. Neither is anything that we earn our own. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And all that we have belongs to the Lord. It is not just keeping it up for self and self and just laboring and laboring and working and working without knowing what it is that we are doing it all for. Just to gather and gather. There is nobody to share it with. It is just amassing for our own self. And mark the contrast that uh, you know, that Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10 gives hmm? as having nothing yet possessing all things. That is the contrast of the child of God who is in poverty and yet possesses the treasure beyond imagination. That is the child of God as having nothing yet possessing all things. Be sure that that is your joy, my dear brethren. Uh, that is first in your eyes and in your heart. That is first, having nothing yet possessing all things. How uh, opposite it is, how contrasted it is to this, this fool who uh, keeps on uh, grabbing for himself, greedy for more, working, laboring hard to get more for himself with nobody to share it for, share it with. And when he sees, and then Solomon goes on to say, goes on to say, why this, this one alone, as he says in chapter, you know, verse 8, there is one alone. He is alone. He is alone. There is no second person. There is not a second. Then Solomon is going on to say, two are better than one. In, in uh, verse 9 onwards, verse 9 to uh, 13, he's saying, don't be alone. Uh, two are better than one. Again, we can say that on the, on the highway. Two are better than one in four things, in four ways. He says in 9, 10, 11, uh, and 12, four ways uh, where two are better than one. <coughs> First of all, two are certainly better than one when it comes to working. Because two workers can get more work done. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. <coughs> Even when they divide the profits, they still get a, get a better return for their efforts than if they had worked alone. Also, it is much easier to do difficult jobs together because one can be an encouragement to others in the field. And then we have in walking in, in verse 10, roads and paths in Palestine, they were not paved or even leveled. And there were many uh, hidden rocks uh, in the fields. And it was not uncommon that even the most experienced traveler would sometimes stumble and fall, uh, perhaps even break a bone or fall into a hidden pit. It is all possible. And how wonderful it would be to have a friend who can help you up or help you out up there. And woe to him who is alone when he falleth. That is what uh, Solomon says in verse 10. Woe to him who is alone when he falleth. If this applies to your physical falls, how much more does it apply to those times when we stumble in our spiritual walk and the need for restoration? In Galatians chapter 6, we read, right? If one of you falls, let the others who are spiritual bring him up, raise him up. Because anyone who thinks that he stands, be careful that he does not fall. And how grateful we should be uh, for Christians who help us, who can help us to walk straight, who can help us to walk straight. So let us uh, understand that two are always better than one in walking together. Thirdly, verse 11, two are better than one in warming one another. Uh, when it comes to warm, two travelers camping out or even staying in the courtyard of a public inn, they would feel the cold of the Palestinian night and need one another's warmth for comfort. And the only way to be warm alone is to carry too many extra blankets and add to your load, right? A live coal. Cold, when left alone, loses its vital heat. And uh, if you go and, you know, when, when you look at uh, when, when uh, chicken or things like that, when you put it on a grill, uh, 
you can see that right at the end of the day when we go to the hotels and restaurants uh, right at the end of the day when uh, when all the grilling and everything is done what they do is they put all the coals separately they they separate it out while it is uh, uh, while it is cooking while the grilling and everything is going on they put the coals together and then they uh, make it burn hotter and harder but when they want the heat to go off they separate it out so that each coal left alone it loses its heat and two are better than one when it comes to warming verse 12 in withstanding two are better than one especially at night uh, though one may be overpowered two can defend themselves it was danger dangerous for anyone to travel alo alone day or night uh, most people often traveled in groups for fellowship and for safety uh, even even david was grateful in second samuel chapter 21 for a friend who stepped in and saved the king's life and we have a lot of applications uh, from these verses two are surely better than one uh, we <clears throat> if we just take the literal meaning of these verses 9 to 12 we often lose a lot of uh, uh, you know substance uh, of the scripture weighty substances if we just just restrict ourselves to the uh, to the literal uh, meaning of these two are always better than one in marriage uh, when we go right into the beginning uh, of creation we see god speaking his mind and god said the same thing it is not good for man to be alone uh, if it is not good for man to be alone in paradise how much worse it is for man to be alone when it comes into the wilderness of this world uh, uh, the uh, the monastic or or celebrate life uh, for higher perfection that is what is taught by many religions right uh, hinduism and many other religions they teach this sort of a monastic life to to be a sannyasi to uh, you know to be a brahmachari and 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 to go and live a lonely life no no that is not what the scripture teaches two are better than one love sweetens the toil it it soothes the sting of trouble and it gives the christian a zest of enjoyment for the uh, for the everyday course of our daily life and two are always better than one in marriage in evangelism two are always better than one uh, our lord himself who knew what was in man ordered his church upon this wise determination when he sent forth his disciples he sent them out two by two as lambs in the midst of wolves two by two was the arrangement that the lord jesus made <coughs> was it not that because if one should fall the others could pick him up what is not, was it not because if one could not withstand both could withstand and support each other hmm? we see that same thing in outreach we often go two by two in our witness we often witness two by two two is better than one in the communion of the saints huh? like the bunch of live coals the lord has put christians together a huh? warm communion of the christian community all is well when the members of the body have the same care for one another recently a <coughs> uh, few uh, you know uh, a couple of uh, months back a uh, few of our uh, employees from from few of my colleagues from my company they had to go on site to uk uh, to the united kingdom they had uh, for a project that has been done there they had to go there for uh, one and a half years and as they are there so uh, i talk with them uh, daily uh, as part of the daily meetings and uh, what they say is they are very lonely there there is no nobody who whom they know and i was just contrasting it to how it would have been if we as believers had gone like if i had gone there there would be always a community of believers there for us they are hindus unfortunately but always it would have been a community of believers wherever you go there would be a community of believers to to warn you the communion of saints how how good it is how pleasant it is how encouraging it is for churches to fellowship together uh, when all the members of the body have the same care towards one another thus from the divine head the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every part supplies according to the effectual working of the measure of every part make us increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love ephesians chapter 4 uh, <coughs> the the principle of religious solitude that isolated being who belongs to no church 
Uh, no church is perfect for him. There are people like that as well in our community. Uh, there are some who who believe that uh, you know uh, being spiritual, uh, being a Christian is only between you and the Lord. It does not involve anything else. Yes, true, it is always between you and the Lord. But the Lord did not save people and leave them to fend for themselves. He added daily those who were saved into the church. He brought them into that fellowship because he knew he knew that two are better than one. It is not it is not uh, enough for Christians to to be uh, solitude isolated people, but to come together to fellowship together. And that, my dear brethren, is one big problem with Zoom today. Many assemblies still continue on Zoom. Still continue on Zoom, and that that uh, that fellowship, that warmth, that uh, you know, warming together, that that communion of love, that is never the same as when the church physically meets together. And so, let us always encourage wherever uh, you know, uh, in 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 places where we are still continuing on Zoom, let us never uh, neglect the gathering together of the saints together. It is better to steadfastly continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer, the church coming together. That itself is together. There can be no real membership with the body, no real communion with each other, other than by coming together. We need to, uh, to come together, to consider one another, provoke one another to good works, encourage one another. The communion of the saints is an outworking of this principle that two are better than one. You see that also the two are better than one in prayer. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19, the Lord gives a promise hmm, that united prayer is sealed with acceptance. Huh? He's saying like this, that the united prayer of two who shall agree in touching anything, when they ask, I will do it for them. That is the prayer that is given. You see that again in church discipline. No discipline is done based on one witness. Two or more testimonies are always needed. And you see that beautifully illustrated, this, this principle of two being better than one in the <coughs> work of uh, John Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress. You see that except for the very first part of his journey, Christian was never alone. It is clear throughout the text that the individual cannot complete the pilgrimage without any assistance from anybody else. And the fallen nature of humanity uh, and, and man's resulting blindness will always get in the way. And pilgrims, when they go together, can guide each other through all those rough spots. First, Christian had a friend named Faithful who was martyred. Then Christian is left without a friend by the, uh, you know, once Faithful died. But then a person called Hopeful joins him and Christian and Hopeful together go on the pathway to the celestial city. And Hopeful sees promise in situations where Christian did not know, like in the story of the dungeon of the doubting castle, in there, hopeful is the one who saw promise where Christian was down and he was downhearted and depressed. Solomon started with one in verse eight, then he moved on to two, and then he closed with three in verse 12. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. One cord could be broken, Two cords would have much more strength, but three cords woven together, it cannot be easily broken. And we need not uh, speculate what is. There are a lot of explanations for this, but one good application would be that if that, if only that third cord would be the Lord Himself, the Lord Himself, uh, binding together, cementing together, and increasing the strength of that cord by by a great degree. Three cords. Join together, the Christian community, along with the Lord, uh, the husband and wife, along with the Lord, uh, the, the saints, along with the Lord, prayer, along with the Lord, everything together with the Lord. The threefold cord could not be easily broken. Now, continuing with that, he goes on to the palace from there, the throne room. He finished the courtroom. He finished the, the, the working place. Uh, then. He finished the highway where two people were walk, where, when a person is walking alone, or and he says that two are always better than one. But now he's saying the next better, the fourth better, and that is in the 
and that is in the palace, in the throne room. And he is saying, uh, he is showing the instability of political power mm, and the fickleness of popularity. And here he is saying a, a sort of a parable or a sort of a story. And in the story, uh, the king in the story had one time uh, heeded his counselor's advice and he ruled wisely. But when he got old, he refused to listen to them. And the problem was more uh, about, uh, about pride and, and uh, you know, senility. So the two contrasts are drawn here between the king and the poor and between the old man and the child. So you read, he's an old and foolish king. And then he, they, he contrasts it with a, a child and who is poor, a poor youth, a poor youth. <clears throat> so this often happens to leaders who are more concerned about themselves than their people. There is a hero in the story. So he's a wise youth who is in prison. And perhaps he was there because he had tried to help the king or the king resented it or somebody in the court lied about the youth. Uh, this is exactly, you know, very similar to what happened to Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 onward. At any rate, this youth got out of prison and then ultimately he became the king. And everybody cheered this, this poor person uh, who was born as a poor person who was in prison and who became the king. And then consider what the story says. Hmm? The young man was born poor, but he became rich. The old king was rich, but his riches did not make him any wiser. So he might have just well, you know, he might just as well have been poor himself. The young man was in prison, but he got out and he took the throne. The old king was imprisoned by his stupidity. And he lost his throne. So far, uh, the moral of the story is that wealth and position are in no way a guarantee for success. Poverty and failure are no barriers to achievement. The key is wisdom itself. The key is wisdom itself. But then the story goes on. It looked as if the, the new young king had made it. He had become the king. But alas, what he says is, verse 16, that his popularity also did not last. He can become the leader of millions. He can be very popular. But then another generation grows up and then rejects him. The new crowd deposed the king and appointed somebody else. And this is exactly what you see in politics and in business all the time. Fame, wealth, honor, uh, popularity. It comes and it goes and it never tarries for a long time. You see that working out in, in all the countries, right? You see that working out in all the countries in the globe. Huh? The people who came out of nothing, they become great. Uh, everybody follows them. They are very popular and uh, people vote for them and people cheer them up. But they are the best. They are the saviors. But after some time, they are just swept under the rug. No remembrance of them anymore. All the pain, all the popularity, it comes and goes forever. It just comes and goes forever. And again, Solomon drew the same conclusion in the end of verse 4, at the end of verse 8, at the end of verse 16. The same conclusion. <coughs> All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Sort of trying to grasp the wind, trying to grasp the wind. It's just like bubbles. You see something in the stair, but soon it just pops off and there is nothing remaining in that place. What a contrast it is to our sovereign. Huh? He is the beginning and the end. He sits on the throne high and lifted up. He is entitled to an undying, undecaying, supreme devotion. He deserves all. He claims all. He gives all from everlasting to everlasting. His seat is uncontested. Huh? There is nobody who will contest for his seat. It's not like this king who became old and poor, who became foolish, who would not listen to anybody, who could not be admonished anymore. He's not like that poor who became rich, claimed the throne, became famous, and then was deposed because the next generation came in 
and all the people pulled him off from his throne and somebody else would come after him. He is the eternal sovereign. From everlasting to everlasting, he alone is God, the sovereign of the universe. And there is nobody who will contest his seat because his seat has been given. Therefore, the father has exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. And at thy name and at his name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. From eternity to eternity, he alone sits upon the throne of the universe. And nobody takes his place. One smart angel dared to think that he could replace that throne. And we know what happened to him. He was cast out of heaven. And one day he will find his portion in the lake of fire, tormented from it, you know, for eternity without end. Nobody claims his throne because he is wise. He is the only wise God. What is the conclusion that we <coughs> learn from this, uh, from this uh, chapter? No matter where Solomon went, no matter what aspect of life he studied, he always learned an important lesson from the Lord. When he looked up, he saw that, that God was in control of time and he balanced the various experiences of life. When he looked within, he saw that man was made for eternity and that God would make all things beautiful in their own time. When he looked ahead, he saw the last enemy that was death that was always waiting for him. And he looked around, he stood, he understood that life is complex, difficult, and it's not easy to explain. No matter where you look, you see trials and problems. And if this chapter teaches us anything, then it is that we need one another. Two are better than one. There are some advantages you may feel to an independent life, but there are much more disadvantages. And we will discover them as we grow older. Uh, the, the chapter emphasizes balance in life. Balance in life. Uh, we need uh, a lot of balance in our life. Better a handful of quietness than both hands full, together with toil and grasping for the wind. That is how uh, verse 6 is said. We need a balance in, the, in life. Uh, one uh, servant of the Lord has outlined this like this. What is the use of might? without right, of plenty without peace, of prosperity without prosperity, of popularity without continuity. And that beautifully sums up this entire chapter. Uh, what is the use of might without right, of plenty without peace, of prosperity without prosperity, of popularity without continuity? It is good to have things that money can buy. It is good, provided. You don't lose those things that money cannot buy. What is really what it is, what is it really costing you in in terms of life, you know, to get the things that are important to you? How much of the permanent are you willing to sacrifice to get your hands on the temporary? Quoting the words of the Lord Jesus. For what shall it profit the man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give? in exchange for his soul. So when you look around, you see all this unfairness in this life. You see, uh, and these questions come out at us so, so uh, powerfully by the Spirit of the Lord. What is the use of all this might without right? What is the use of plenty without peace? What is the use of having all your prosperity without nobody to enjoy it after you? What is the use of having all this popularity, which is just fickle, which just goes out after some time without any continuation. But when we look at the Lord himself, he gives might with right. He is always just and the justifier of those who come to him. Uh, he comes, he takes the unjust, he takes, lifts up the poor and, and seats him among the princes. In Christ, there is plenty and yes, there is peace. In Christ, there is prosperity and yes, there is prosperity. In, in Christ there is popularity and yet there is continuance. Oh, he is, he is the one about whom all this is true. But as people, as human beings, these questions are so, so uh, uh, should, should, should shake us up 
and should ask us to question why we do a lot of things. May that be the way that God deals with us as we continue studying the book of Ecclesiastes and to question ourselves to see what are we doing. For the word of the Lord indeed is powerful, sharper than the two-edged sword, and it pierces to the dividing ascender of the soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and actions, the intents of the heart. May the Lord add his blessings to the meditation of his word. Thank you, brother, uh, for that exposition in chapter four of Ecclesiastes. And we thank God for the precious thoughts that have been brought to our hearts. Uh, even as uh, King Solomon visited the courtroom and he witnessed those uh, who were oppressed, uh, the innocent people. And there was a reminder to us to remember them that are in bonds and in the workplace, uh, we saw how we need to have the balanced life, not too industrious and not to be idle and lazy. And uh, then on the highway, where we saw two are better than one in, um, in the marriage, in communion uh, with the saints, we need each other. And uh, coming together is for our encouragement and for uh, and that is what we had in the conclusion uh, that uh, two are better than one. And then in the palace, uh, lastly, uh, the instability of the political powers. And we saw uh, that it is only the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ who is from everlasting uh, to everlasting, who is enthroned above. And may our focus be upon him. And let us thank God for these uh, wonderful truths that have been brought to our hearts this morning. And uh, may we align our lives in the light of what we have uh, heard this morning through uh, the word of God uh, expounded by our dear uh, brother. So tomorrow our brother will be continuing the study uh, and request you all for your participation and your prayers. Request brother Joy Vergis to close in prayer. Am I audible? Yes, brother. Uh, let us bow our heads and give thanks to our God. Holy Father, merciful God, one more day you are granted to us to come together at your feet. Thank you for enabling Benaya to explain the word from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We meditated. King Solomon was able to understand this. Lord gave him the wisdom and understanding. Lord gave the spirit, Holy Spirit to enable him to write it. And it is even today applicable to our lives. Very clearly he says, what is better in the life? Life is sometimes we feel it is vanity and the vexation of the spirit. But one life Lord has given is very important in our lives. Lord knows where we stand. Our God is a sovereign God. He has given wisdom and understanding to live in this present life. Some are very hardworking and industrious. Some are very lazy and they become poor and poor. Some are quiet people. And they are not selfish at all. They live happily. There are selfish people. They are greedy. They do not want to help others. All these groups of people are there in the world. Help us to examine our own life. What group we are. Are we really trustworthy people? Always communicating with the Lord. Having communion with the people of God. This is very essential in our life. Two is always better than one. Lord speaks to us that way. Even when the Lord sent the disciples to create this, uh, to, to, to spread the gospel, he told, go by two by two. That is the principle Lord himself taught. Always we say that we are together. In any decisions we have to take together 
family should be together an individual cannot live happily all these are lessons for us lord we look to you we give thanks praises worship you are the true and living god we commit ourselves to you thank you for the trc ministry when i is continuing these studies we earnestly praying for all those who are sick among us especially our joymon and the family we commit them he is also taking some treatment all other dear ones we are nearby or far away thank you for the all the participants every day morning from 7 to 8 when we sit in your presence we feel that the very presence of our lord lord is speaking to us help us to obey all your commandments bless us with all the blessing we pray we know that our lord's promises are true surely and certainly our lord will come soon and we are going to be with the lord we give thanks praises worship take care of each one of us and fulfill your plans and purpose we commit all this matter to you hear our humble prayer and we bring this prayer and supplications with thanksgiving we ask this prayer in the sweet and precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen thank you uncle thank you all for joining thank you lord thank you thank you benaya